what say you, Richard Ellen Murdoch, are you guilty or not guilty of the felonies wherein you stand and die? Not guilty. How shall you be tried? By God and my country. The exact time when Paul and Maggie Murdoch were murdered. At the end of the investigation, it was obvious. I'm not here to work with them. Okay. And the whole point is to have this not solved. That's a good one. This case is unique. It's unprecedented in South Carolina history. Max picked all this. I mean, they're perfect. have to pay all that back? We paid every cent of it back. The Why'd attorneys you? put it in because Alec stole it. Why did you have to pay, repay that money? Because it was due to the client and Alec Murdoch stole it. Because Alec stole it. But Alec had stolen it. Because Alec stole it. I have to pay that money back. Because Alec stole it as well. Wow. Powerful testimony today from Jeannie Seconder. She is the chief financial officer for Murdoch's former law firm. And she, as you heard, she said over and over again to the jury um, about this mountain of evidence coming in of alleged financial crimes of Alec Murdoch that he stole money. According to her, he stole money from the law firm and from his clients. We're going to dig into that tonight mm -hmm. for our daily recap at the top. I've got our exclusive legal analyst, Charlie Condon, who is the South Carolina's former attorney general. We have Drew Tripp here, executive producer, manning the controls masterfully is Maxwell Harrison. He's also going to be fielding any questions that we can capture for you guys. Um, we've been getting uh, some great feedback, and we're certainly going to try and address some of that. But since this is a daily recap, we will... We will try and do it in a timely fashion. So I'm um, going to ask you right off the bat. We mm -hmm. got this financial evidence in. Yep. We heard Jeannie Seconder. She was able to get um, in front of the jury and tell them in no uncertain terms. Uh, she believes Alex stole money from the firm and stole money from the clients. And it happened for the last 10 years. And it's, what is it, somewhere around $4 million? Close to, I think it was four something, close to five. And, and, and to set the stage, uh, uh, I think it might be important from a legal perspective because the defense uh, attorney Griffin requested Judge Newman to instruct the jury again that's right. that this evidence is only to be considered to prove motive, not to prove that the defendant has bad character or to show that he might be more likely to have committed these murders and, mm -hmm. and possessing the, uh, the um, firearms uh, during the commission of violent crime. However... I must say, given the, I mean, use the word mountain. I think that's a, a, an apt uh, word. Maybe a Himalayan mountain today. I think we're going to have several of these type mountains come over the next couple of days. The amount of reprehensible conduct by a, forget him being, you know, that he's an attorney by anybody, but particularly since he's an attorney, the breach of duties that are owed to his clients, to his law firm, just, really to humanity, and for lack of a better description, because he, how many hours? Two or three hours of this? It was just... Yeah, how long was second chair on the stand for, do you know? Most of the morning. Um, sorry, you guys might have caught me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, looking off camera, working on yeah, some I mean, YouTube it, stuff it, in the it, background. It, but. Was, it was so much information relative to his theft of, of millions and millions of dollars from somebody who obviously comes from a high income stature. Right. And so I think the challenge for a juror, if I'm sitting there as a juror, okay, the judge is telling me not to use this to impugn his character. That's a real challenge for any human. I like mm -hmm. to think they're gonna try really hard to do that and, and we'll do that. But uh, the defense, I thought, tried to question this being a motive, which right. I think is, is, is an effective strategy for them. But just in terms of, of the amount of information that went in there on yeah. somebody taking so much money from so many innocent people in his law firm, it was, to me, just just mm. incredible. And I know this witness has testified. She's a very effective witness, by the way, but she's testified. I guess this is the third time in federal right, court. Right, but this is the first time in front uh, well, she did it. You, you heard her. Um, Drew covered, extensively covered the Russell Lafitte mm -hmm. Trial, mm -hmm. who also happens to be her brother-in-law, yes. Just to make it even more complicated, boy, these are small southern towns. You can't, you can't make this stuff up. Russell Lafitte um, was mm -hmm. Alec Murdoch's banker 
for all intents and purposes, right? Mm -hmm. At Palmetto State Bank, you covered the trial. You've seen Jean Seconder in action. She didn't mess around. These were these were family. This was family that she had to testify against, and she didn't she didn't like it. Uh, and I, I will say also, from my perspective today, we did see Jeannie Seconder last week in the in-camera portion mm -hmm. uh, where she testified without the jury present. If you missed that, go back and find one of our live streams on YouTube or somewhere and go watch that one if you want to see her even more at her spitfire best. Because there, in that setting... Jim Griffin came at her a little, honestly, a yeah, yeah. little more right, yeah. Very strongly right. than he did today. That's and true. that was kind of a mock run, a test run for them. And she was equally prepared and equally ready to give it back as she was in that testimony. But, it, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're trying to remember here that this is not entertainment. This is, this mm -hmm. is a real right. life situation, mm -hmm. life and death situation, um, where not only that, she's testifying to the aspect that Many, many, many people were lied to, mm -hmm. stolen from, and things like that. But from the pure aspect of courtroom drama, courtroom drama, and yes, to an extent, entertainment, she has breathed life into what we've been seeing because it has gotten a bit. Even with hers, when they had Miss Secretary go, go over, that's a great point. Yeah, because this is. It could arguably be dry financial information, but she put life to it, and she came across to me that she was personally offended by this defendant's conduct. Just mm -hmm. was just Very something much. that she could imagine being done to her. Then she talked about knowing the family for what? Just her basically Since her whole she life. Was Sixteen. She went to high school with Alec Murdoch. She knew this. These were people that she she's known her whole life, mm -hmm. and um, and she took it as a personal affront, mm -hmm. and and. And I think it's important to look at two things that, that really popped up to me was one that she said she, you could see she was holding a lot of personal pain about this and guilt because as the CFO and the COO, she was taking responsibility for the fact that she had not caught this earlier on. This, had, this oh, yeah, scheme, good. they've gone on for 10 years. Yes, yes. And, and she didn't get to catch it earlier. Mm -hmm. And she is, she is still dealing with, some pain from that. Yeah, right. And remember how she, I thought it was so dramatic how she ended her testimony by saying, in effect, I don't know the real Alec Murdoch, no one, and I don't think anyone else does, or worse those that effect. There was yeah. no defense objection at that point, although they later objected to another witness trying to testify essentially along those lines. So it was a direct comment really on character, which the jury is to ignore. Right. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask you specifically about that, Charlie, is... What, what it, this is the third time we've heard Creighton Waters ask somebody that question, uh, ending you, today with Ronnie Crosby on the stand. And it was not until Ronnie that the defense for Alec Murdoch objected. It's a total state theme. I, interesting you pick that up because I think this defense could possibly talk in terms of it being an improper theme that the state's trying to develop. But I think it's a bit late for that since they didn't object to it earlier. They may be able to get the judge to instruct the state not to do it. But I think throughout that courtroom today, I just, you know, you, you felt like that, yes, he's got a double life going here. He's on the face of it, happy, friendly to other people, to his family. And this uh -huh. conduct that went on since, what, 2011 or something, the theft that mm -hmm. went on? Yes. And he did. He did ask that question a couple of times, and it was asked and answered. And it came. For, who was the other witness that he asked that of? Because it was another Will important. Loving. Will did, Loving, yes. Yeah, he seconded your mm -hmm. Will Loving last week, and mm -hmm. then finally Ronnie Crawford. Yeah, and so I, I don't know how you felt about it from, from, from hearing it, but I feel like the jurors have accepted that this person on the outside could be one way, but on the inside be someone completely different, witness the financial crimes they've seen, and arguably witness the murders that he's committed, although I want to get back to that same legal point. It's a fine legal point, but a very important one. They're not to consider it for character and to show propensity to commit the crime, but human nature being what it is, that's challenging. And I would, I would love to hear your take on the striking that balance from the state's perspective. And we've heard about mm -hmm. a lot about res gesti and mm -hmm. 404 B C D. <laughs> I'm, mm -hmm. I'm being flippant about that, but with respect to the the very specific rules we've heard about, and 
to your point, striking that balance, what what does the state have to be careful of, and what? How well, much of this could be appealed later yeah, on? Based on what's happened? This is definitely the main ground for appeal if he's convicted. That, that Judge Newman made an error. I don't think he did uh, on on much, if not all of this. Uh, I do think it's admissible. But one way to cover yourself, and I, I prosecute a lot of cases, and I learned sort of the hard way when you prosecute these to go all out, then it comes back and you have to retry it. I had a number of capital cases I had to retry that way, so I learned to hold back here a little bit and protect the record. But one way that he could do that very successfully is in closing argument to say that you're not to consider this, mm-hmm. which, of course, the judge will instruct. But, again, let's be real here, right? I mean, um, if I'm on that jury having heard all this information, it's challenging to focus in on, okay, it's just for motive, and let's talk about that. So I think within the jury room, that will be the discussion only. I would expect that to be the case. But I'd, I can't help but think in the back of, of at least some jurors' minds is going to be this, whoa, he did this sort of miss. And we haven't heard the worst of it, I believe. I think the uh, Tony Satterfield might be the worst one that we're going to see, uh, if that's possible. But that he did this to other people that he – presumably loved and trusted. Uh, so it's not too big a leap to envision the sort of horrendous activity that he's being accused of. And uh, It's going to be tough. Mm-hmm. When you right. think, uh, you're human, you heard it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, it's just so, but... Well, and I think it's really hard. I mean, the, the, they're absolutely trying to get him to, to differentiate, mm-hmm. you know, between this is the motive for the killing, this is the motive for the killing, but how do you differentiate? I mean, we watched him. We watched Jeannie. She was looking at the, the jury, and she's saying, they, he stole, he stole, he stole, and I didn't know this guy like I thought I did. And then you see the jury. We're watching the jury watch Alec, and it was really very powerful moment in that courtroom very. to see that the jury was putting two and two together, that this is the guy who stole millions of dollars from from these folks. Right. And we'll talk about this later, but we got that also from Ronnie Crosby, yeah, that exactly. he felt personally offended by the thefts. And so I think it'd be fair to say, wouldn't you, based upon the evidence today, that no one's there to say that, that he has good character. But they're not to consider that. That's right. where we are. Yeah, but how do you how do you differ? Mm-hmm. How do you separate the two? It's gonna it, you've got to perform some I don't know, if not mental gymnastics, then you've got to be very disciplined with how you reason exactly. through it as a juror. Yeah. But to Anne's point, uh, something she just said and something you've just said, uh, tying it all together. And I know we've got a lot to get to and mm-hmm. we, uh, we're, we're going to move on after this, but uh, more of a legal question for you, Charlie. Mm-hmm. I think one of the uh, keeping, keeping track of the feedback and Mm -hmm. reaction I'm seeing on social media and just talking to people. Tying it all together seems to be something that people are wondering when we're going to get it. And I, from a, from a, Uh, from a standpoint of Mm -hmm. what can, what can the prosecutors do? Here's what I think the state's doing. And I'd like to talk to them after this trial is over with, but I've noticed there's a rhythm to, their evidence production and they've got to get these technical witnesses in for chain and such and they've got to get in evidence of other crimes to prove motive and they've got to tie in all these circumstantial pieces of evidence together and i've noticed that each day those three themes here's tara good to see you those three the three things i mentioned they knock off some of that each one of those three each day so i think they're probably Looking through, like, we've got to get through these, whatever it is, 75 witnesses. Let's not bunch them together. Let's mix them up. But let's do have a strong, and I must say, every day that I've been here, there has been a really, today has been a couple of strong witnesses, but there have been really strong witnesses for the state each and every. I haven't seen a, what I call a dull day for the state yet. So that, I think they've done a good job of mixing it up. But that's a very good point because the amount of circumstantial evidence is here. And this is a circumstantial evidence case. They're tough to prove. They can be proven. And I think they're, they have this overarching theme, and not to jump ahead, but the but the raincoat was part of that circumstantial evidence today too. Right. Um, and my my question to that point would be, just from a pure spectator's point mm-hmm. of view, is there procedurally or from a decorum or rule standpoint, is there anything stopping a Creighton Waters or a John Metters from? 
making, I guess this would qualify maybe as counsel testifying or leading the witness, saying, like making conclusions and pointing out things to the jury at this stage in the trial when they're doing direct examination, can they say, great, great you point. just heard him say yeah, this yeah. and you remember earlier we heard somebody say that? Great point. Here's what I think is going on with them. They, they gave their bare bones in the opening. Mm-hmm. And as I heard that, I thought that mm-hmm. was a pretty good case. But they're, they're, they're rightfully worried about what gets in, what doesn't get in, and how does it come across. So not tying themselves down yet to their overarching theme. But I'm, theme, but I'm starting to get it. I mean, what I'm getting is we have great proof on he's lied to the, to the police about a key p- fact. He's back there, and the timeline, we believe, fits well, and it's going to be woven together Towards them, but to your point, no, th- there's still tension there, and I think the the state, I mean, the defense, rightly has a point that that they're not there yet on proving this case beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. That's for sure. Max, did you have something that came up? Yeah, somebody asked a question. Uh, was Paul uh, liable for Maggie? I mean, um, for Mallory's thing, or wasn't Paul, uh, Alex and uh, Maggie? Oh, okay. Um, uh, so- they were all sued. Yeah. Um, well, I, technically, I don't think. Paul had been sued. Um, they they were simply going after uh, they were simply going after Alec first, and I believe we even heard Mark Mark uh, Tinsley testify in his in camera hearing yesterday that if the venue had gotten changed the way that the Parker's fo- mm-hmm. Parker's Parker's convenience stores uh, folks had wanted to, they wanted to get the venue of the lawsuit changed in the boat crash case. He said he was going to end up suing Maggie and Paul as part of that too. But for the for the time being, I think only Alec was sued. Since then, since Maggie and Paul's death, I believe uh, Maggie's estate has been added to the lawsuit, mm-hmm. and I'm not 100 well, percent sure on Paul. Maggie and Buster ended up getting, and then they were uh, yeah, Maggie sued as and well. Bu- Maggie's estate and Buster were both sued. They've now settled mm-hmm. that, so that is now out. Uh-huh. Um, and now it's just Alec Murdoch and Parker's, from what I understand. I'm pretty sure that's correct. But to, go ahead. Yeah, to the question of liability, though, I think they were tr- they were the Tinsley and the Beach family. Their their case was multifaceted on liability. You had Alec because it was his boat. Uh, you had Alec and Maggie for knowledge of Paul's underage drinking mm-hmm. and contributing to the delinquency of a minor. You had Buster for contributing to Paul's state by giving him a, a his ID. ID. Yeah. Um, all three of them, they were held some sort of liability. And we've learned, uh, we've learned since then with pr- subsequent filings in that case, they weren't just allowing it. Uh, they being Alec and Maggie, the Tinsley camp, they can, he contends mm-hmm. that, they were encouraging. yeah encouraging it and uh, subsidizing it or uh, yeah. f- fomenting it, if you will, because they were giving Paul the credit card and they were seeing those credit card statements. So they had to know what he was spending it on. You knew there were lemon drops coming out of Luther's for sure. Well, let's get back to we've got a we got another clip we want to play from today. What happened with um, Ronnie Crosby? Ronnie Crosby is the uh, former law partner of Alec Murdoch, but also much more importantly, one of his closest friends, his kids. Uh, there were tears on the stand today. Um, Ronnie Ronnie considered Paul. I mean, he uh, obvious, obviously was incredibly close to this oh. kid. They called him Uncle Ronnie. And, um, yeah, we heard a lot of uh, emotion from Ronnie. This was a really tough day for him. Um, let's just hear what he had to say. This Wait, sorry, to set this up, Ronnie is... Um, having to talk about what about this dog video once again he is going to you're, we're going to hear a clip about the dog video being the one where at 8:44 we hear Alex's voice on this audio clip that had been unlocked off of Paul's phone this is a very important part of the evidence um, for the state the three voices on that video are the voices of Paul Murdoch Maggie Murdoch and Alec Murdoch. And how sure are you? How sure are you? I'm 100% sure that's whose voices are on that, the audio there. So this is a 
multiple times now. We've heard from people that are incredibly close oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. to the Murdochs that this is indeed Alex's voice is heard in the background. This blows Alex's alibi out the window, according to the state, because they say, well, he said that he was taking a nap and he never went to the kennels. And he told Ronnie that he was taking a nap and he never went to the kennels. And then Ronnie has to hear this. And there is a time when the shoe drops. And I think that was the time for Ronnie. Yeah, and I, I, I could set the stage uh, because I, I think this is really important, this trial. And every trial has a, has a turning point. I'm, I'm sensing that that might have been it. And here, here's, here's the, 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 to set the stage. He came across as very credible, mm -hmm. that he wasn't trying to to send his former law partner down the river, so to speak. He's, a, in, in effect, a reluctant witness, but he's going to tell the truth. And he's got this really close relationship with the family and with the defendant, but he's asked, did the defendant tell you wh what happened that night? And he wasn't happy to say this, but he said he told me and everyone else there that he never went down to the kennels. You could hear a pin drop in that courtroom. Then the state, I thought, very effective trial work here. They then played that video that we've all seen, the dog video. Total silence. And then they played it. Very short. And after it played, he then, the, uh, the, the sound, the voices you just heard, he identified the voices. And at that point, and I thought Creighton Waters did an excellent job. I don't think he could pick this up on television, but he waited a little bit. He paused. And within that courtroom, there was an acknowledgement from everyone there. And I could be reading too much into this, but I happened to catch Judge Newman's face. I looked at the jurors, and there was an acknowledgement that he did it. This is really serious. He, 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 he did it. Now, I'm not saying that this case is over with. We've talked about that. But I am saying that... It was a powerful moment from the state, and the defense has some work to do. Well, and that's exactly right, and this is the state's time to do this. I mean, if they're going to do it, this is when they're going to pull out all the punches, It right? was a good day today for them, and I suspect a couple more days will be good days today. And they ended, I don't know if you want to jump to this, but I thought they ended very strongly with the, uh, she's in the middle of, she finished her direct, we have cross-examination, but you have this blue poncho. Raincoat. Yeah, and let's get to that um, before we before we wrap it up today. The blue raincoat. Let's listen to what the GSR expert, gunshot residue, um, mm -hmm. came in and talked about the gunshot residue that was found on a blue raincoat, um, and what it has to do with this trial. That it's on the inside, uh, in order for it to be uh, consistent with transfer an object or objects with a high amount of gunshot primer residue on it would have had to transfer to it. Um, so they would have had to have more gunshot primer residue particles on them to begin with in order to transfer the amount of gunshot primer residue I found on this coat. And, and as far as a recently fired firearm, would your, would your findings be consistent with that item containing a recently fired firearm? I, it is possible, yes. With that. Well, this is going to be really tough because there is uh, their witness yesterday who was also reluctant to some degree, or at least looked that way. Shelly Smith, the caretaker, said that um, Alec Murdoch showed up at the house with something blue in his arms, carrying it like a baby. The kind of because I'm just saying it like this, they didn't say like a baby, but they literally mm -hmm. said it was like this. Right. Uh, Creighton Waters even slipped in there. Did it look like a rifle? And she said yes. And the defense went, I object. But it was too late because that had already been said out loud. Now we're hearing this raincoat's got GSR all over it, gunshot residue, huge problem. Um, but I mean, I think that defense, because they did not search this house for three months, where they found this raincoat. There's a lot of ways to poke holes in this. What do you all think? Well, I agree, but I, I do think, I understand now why the defense really didn't want this in, because mm -hmm. they were arguing that the probative being the, the evidentiary value of this, that the prejudicial effect is far outweighed because it, it, it will come across strongly. I kept thinking, well, how could it come across that strongly given the tarp versus raincoat? Now I see it because we had veteran prosecutor John Metters on the direct examination, and I thought he did a masterful job 
he actually explained their theory because what he emphasized was on the inside of this poncho, this raincoat, on the inside now, not the outside, there was massive amounts of, of gunshot residue. And he guttered this expert to say that it was a lot, it was very unusual and remarkable to her. And then at his end, we'll see how the defense handles this in the morning, but at the end he says, well, is that consistent with somebody putting weapons inside this poncho and carrying it around? And she said, yes. Sure. And so he pointed out what their theory is going to be relative to this. But I, I got to thinking, well, golly, you know, how does gunshot residue get on the inside of a poncho? Mm. So I, I thought another, again, we talked about circumstantial evidence, but another strand of the rope that I think was laid today or put out there for, for the jury today. Yeah. Final thoughts? I just, I, I just want to point out that it, it's not totally implausible to think that someone could wrap a rifle up in, especially not an AR-15 style rifle, inside of a jacket. Uh, you, you know, to, to be a legal mm -hmm. non-NFA firearm a rifle has to have a barrel of 16 inches 16 inches if you, know, mm -hmm. if you guys can see me it's about that long or so uh, give or take mm -hmm. and then might be like 16 and a half inches but then uh, you know the actual receiver mechanism of an ar-15 is only about that long and then you've got the stock on an ar-15 which can be collapsed down and in some cases it can be folded over to the side don't know if any of that was on that particular rifle i don't think it was a folding stock rifle from what we've heard but in reality, uh, we are talking about something that might be maybe this long and could you collapse the stock down, and that's a big jacket. It's not implausible. I d certainly don't think it's implausible. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to see what um, defense says tomorrow. Max, is there any more questions that we needed to tackle tonight? Or are we going to – oh, do you have – oh, wait. Do you there have you something? This is wait, so wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Really we, just, we, just need to build, <laughs> we just need to build a final point segment in for me at the end of each one <laughs> yes. of these things. Final thoughts. Um, two things. The candor that we heard, uh, I think, for, especially from Jeannie Seconder, and we heard from Ronnie Crosby. Uh, candor, and by candor, I'm being a bit euphemistic. Uh, they said the, they dro Ronnie Crosby dropped an F-bomb, and uh, Jeannie Seconder on the stand said, BS. Uh, uh, the Alec art of Murdoch's BS. A BS artist, and they didn't, they didn't censor themselves. They said the whole thing. Do you think that plays in any particular way bad or good? I was a, not so much with Miss Seconder. I felt like that flowed naturally. I was a bit surprised that, that Mr. Crosby articulated that. I, I personally was a bit surprised. Uh, I'm assuming that he wanted the jury to know just how upset he was. And so that was, I think, the purpose. It, 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 again, I felt like there could have been other ways to express that without using that sort of obscenity in a public courtroom. That would be my only thought. Right. And I, I will go on the record and say that not go on the record, but I will add for the record that Ronnie Crosby did not use the F, F word when he gave that same testimony in Judge Richard Gurgle's federal courtroom uh, right? a few months ago. Interesting. My That's second, uh, my second point, and then we can move on. Just speaking as an objective um, observer, uh, Ronnie Crosby's testimony about Paul. I think more than anything today was about more than anything, I think really in this whole trial, except maybe Shelly Smith was about the most moving thing I'd seen when he was talking mm -hmm. about Paul and True. how much he loved Paul. Mm -hmm. And this, this yes. might not mean anything to a lot of people, but to a certain segment of people into a certain culture and especially Southern men, when he said that Paul killed his first deer on my place. <laughs> that's, I, yeah. I get that one. That's, mm -hmm. if you're flooded. from around here, Mm -hmm. And you grew up the way yeah. a lot of us have. That was a that's a that's a point. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. I want to. That is hard. I hate to add to this too long, but did you catch also how this was a point to me where he talked about how Paul would use rifles to kill these hogs, but that I hear using a knife or knives. Yeah, that's some, explain uh, that one. That's really getting. That's really getting uh, into the hunting mode, right? Uh, yeah, that, uh, and I could go way down a rabbit hole on this, but that, yeah, that's actually like, yeah, yeah, other parts, uh, that's, it's like a test of manhood thing to okay. an extent, but also in other... Do you other, jump on the hog with a knife and just you, start stabbing or what? No, what they do is you would use what are called catch dogs. Uh, you have your hounds that mm -hmm. find and pursue, mm -hmm. the, pursue the actual wild 
wild boar, then you release what are called catch dogs. Mm -hmm. They chase it down wherever the the hounds have baited. it. Right. They hold the hog. You come up to it and you dispatch it with a knife in close yeah. quarters. Um, and they actually do that. I, I've, TM, they've actually do is that. Is this TMI now? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit grotesque, but they, they do that in other countries where they don't, may not have such liberal firearms laws as us. Um, and again, it's kind of a test of manhood thing to see. Um, you know, uh, hog hunting is not for the faint of heart uh, if you do it in the way some people do it, even here. Um, but wild boars are dangerous. Yes, they're very dangerous. Mm -hmm. They're very destructive. Right. Um, very anyway, bad. moving on. Moving on. Um, <laughs> Thank Max, you. anything else that we need to get to before we wrap this up? Uh, people were asking about the, you know, the early claims of him being like a drug addict, and people yeah, were really getting that brought up. Great question. It's been radio silence on that, right? Well, I mean, absolutely. So I don't far. think it will be for long. I think, think we are going to have not for too long. I mean, it's definitely getting brought up on the prosecution side mm -hmm. um, because unless there's something. Unless yeah, it wasn't an opening wrong. statement. No one, not, there was um, nothing an opening statement, we, was there? We've been hearing about side? Cousin Eddie on his way. Mm -hmm. We've been hearing about it. Now, Eddie's in jail up in uh, Lexington. Yeah. Um, so we've been hearing that Eddie Smith, um, his um, alleged drug dealer, longtime mm -hmm. drug dealer, mm -hmm. that's the way I think his own defense team termed mm -hmm. it, um, that he's going to be coming in to testify. So as far as his opioid addiction, um, how much of this plays for the state? We'll see. I think Eddie may have some a lot to talk about. Um, but what's what's going to be really interesting is to see how the defense uses that yep. as well, because mm -hmm. they they certainly know they know we we interviewed Eddie. They know that, um, and he said that he was like a brother to him. So where do you go from there? Mm -hmm. We'll see. All right, guys, we've got another day ahead of us tomorrow, and please join us. Uh, we're going to be back in that courtroom watching every second and bringing it to you at the end of the day. So we'll see you then. Bye. Good night.